you try to carry your meditation into daily life. You find that one of the big problems is all the activity around you, the things that other people are doing or saying. Even sometimes the energy you feel that they're radiating towards you can be a disturbance. But an even bigger disturbance can be what you're doing yourself, the things you're doing and saying, thinking. This is why the Buddha puts such huge emphasis on the practice of restraint as a part of training the mind. In other words, you place certain limits on what you do and say and think, following the precepts, exercising restraint over the senses, even having a sense of moderation in your conversation. All of these things are ways of paring down the disruptions that you create for your own meditation, for your own practice. A lot of people complain that restraint is like confinement. But you have to ask yourself exactly who's getting confined. Your greed, your aversion, your delusion. All the unskillful members of the committee that used to be able to throw their weight around. They're the ones who are feeling the confinement. But when they're confined, you find that there are other parts of the mind that actually flourish. And when you have more control over the impulses that come into the mind to say or do or think this or that, the other thing, and learn how to control the unskillful impulses. There is more room for the spontaneity of your skillful impulses. Many people comment, seeing some of the really great Ajahns, John Cha, John Fu, John Li, John Mahabhu, how spontaneous they are. You can never really predict what they're going to do or say. That's because their skillful impulses had free reign. And then we're being interfered with the unskillful impulses. So look at restraint not as confinement, but as a period of training you go through. In which you're creating a better environment for your meditation, and at the same time you're learning a lot about the mind. It's not that restraint is just simple suppression. You can't really exercise restraint without understanding. And the way the Buddha recommends that you exercise restraint fosters understanding, fosters a lot of the other good qualities you need to develop in your meditation, like mindfulness, alertness, ardency. Take the precepts. You have to be mindful in order to keep those precepts in mind, not forget them, and alert to what you're doing. in order to figure out how not to suffer from the fact that you've taken a precept. Taking the precept against lying, there are times when telling the truth is going to cause difficulties. So how do you get around that without telling a lie? That takes discernment. There's also the discernment of foreseeing difficulties. You take the precept against killing, you've got to make sure your house is not the sort of house that's going to be invaded by termites or other pests. What do you do to prevent that from happening? You think ahead of time. Same with moderation in your conversation. You have to learn discernment to figure out what's necessary and what's not. Your standard of necessary, how does that get measured? There are times when you do have to joke around with people. You do have to say things that are not all that serious, but they, per they serve a real purpose. Because what you're doing is you're looking at why you're speaking, what you expect the effects to be. That's an issue of discernment. And you have to keep in mind when you're engaging in just friendly conversation, there comes a point where it goes over 
overboard, goes beyond bounds, and you have to have a sense of that and hold yourself in check when you reach that point. Same with restraint of the senses. It's not that you simply don't look or don't listen. You look at why you're looking. Why are you listening? Are you looking for the sake of lust? Are you looking for the sake of anger? Are you listening for the sake of lust or anger? How can you look or listen at the same thing with a different purpose? How can you look at the object that was exciting lust or providing food for your lust in a way that starves the lust? Learn to look in a different way, listen in a different way. At the same time, you have to notice what is the effect on your mind of looking or listening or smelling or tasting different things. You see that it's giving rise to unskillful states, you've got to stop. Turn your eyes around, turn your ears around. In other words, you look at the process of sensory perception as a causal process. And you're not just on the passive receiving end, you're the active one going out looking for certain things. This is an important insight, seeing how the mind flows out to its senses. And why? What's the impetus? You know, learning how to turn things around. There's a lot of discernment that you can learn, a lot of things you can learn about the mind as you exercise restraint over the senses. So it's not just suppression, it's not just confinement. It's a process of creating a more peaceful environment. When you're not engaged in breaking the precepts or running off at the mouth, or looking for everything that's going to excite greed, aversion, and delusion, the mind has a much better environment in which to settle down. So it improves your concentration, it improves your mindfulness, and improves your discernment. This is why restraint is such an important container for the practice. As you maintain restraint as you go through the day, you find that your practice builds up momentum. You're not dividing your life into the times when you meditate and times when you don't meditate. When your time doesn't get chopped up, there's more of a flow. Mindfulness can become more continuous. Alertness can become more continuous. This way your daily practice helps your formal meditation, your formal meditation helps your daily practice. It's when the practice becomes akaliko, or timeless. That's when it can develop strength. And the different parts of your life are not working at cross purposes. Everything's working together. It can use the lessons you learned in your formal practice throughout the rest of the day. It's like someone who goes down to the gym, exercises, but doesn't use his or her strength only in the gym. You take it out and use it for your own benefit, for the benefit of the people around you. Because after all, in the meditation, we're dealing with greed, aversion, and delusion, and they don't show up only when you're sitting here with your eyes closed. They show up all the time. And so you want to be in a position to deal with them all the time. And restraint helps pare down the issues. So that they're manageable. <laughs>